Many believe that the transition between EA Redwood Shores to visual games was a very minor one. However, the change would be drastic with those who originally made the first installment of Dead Space, either leaving to seek out new horizons or staying to see what happens. The main man in charge of seeing out the story and who was responsible for the project would be known as Glenn Schofield, who would leave the twisted dimension of Dead Space behind, and so the studio would then eventually become Visual Games. However, with the changes to the team, this would bring about changes to the overall plots and stories. As you see, between the first and second installment of the series, there was a tone shift within the confines of the story, and most importantly, the antagonists. In this video, we'll be going over the evolution of the Marker's properties and explaining when the rewrite to the accursed obelisk would occur, and a theory on why Visual sought to go down that path. In the events of the first activations of the three duplicates of the Black Marker, these being the Red Markers, that are running parallel to the events in Catalyst, a text log can be obtained in Dead Space once you have beaten the game, in which it details these events, once they have activated the monoliths of Red. Though being made before the book Martyr would be published, it still does reference events that play out in the book with lines about Altman and the lies that were set up by Markov. However, getting back on track, the log details the initial properties of the marker, stating that the hue is purely a cosmetic difference, so not set on personality or anything else any articles would have you believe. As believe me, I have seen a lot of them theorizing about why Marker 3A, 3B and the Black Marker act differently to others in which some sound insane, as if the marker's influence stretches far beyond the games. The log goes further into detail about the activation with the sound frequencies. From here it reads, when activated began to emit a highly complicated rhythmic pattern across a wide band of frequencies from actual sound waves through the electromagnetic spectrum to alpha, delta and theta brain waves. It mostly seems inert and harmless aside from some slight interference with communication equipment. Further down the log, we come to another property which is the symbols that turns out that they have a purpose. It turns out that the symbols can be translated into a code for DNA, instructions to be followed, and with them, the scientists would create a new life form, that being microbial, where the log continues going into detail about the recombination period of their researches talking about their discovery on how the organism takes dead cells and begins to reconstruct them into something else. The next part would read as follows. More confounding results from our research today. As we moved what we are now calling the Red Marker, we had to pass by the Celia Lab area. The scientists working at the time complained about interruptions in the necrotic flesh experiments. As it turns out, the field generated by the marker creates a dead space around itself that forces the recombination effect into dormancy. The next part of the puzzle comes from the last entry to the log, stating, My remaining crew is hastily constructing a transmitter for the marker in an attempt to broaden the signal it is emanating. Dr. Foster said that the idea came to him in a vision. Our hope is to use the signal to keep the unchecked infection from spreading to the landing area. In doing so, the outbreak had been paused 
as the marker signal was broadened, but in doing so, the dormancy or dead space field was enlarged as well, sweeping over the entire station, if not then the entire planet. Now here is a question, if later in the series the markers do not need to broaden their signals and can commit to convergence, then why did this one need to do that? Reason I ask is because a few individuals are convinced that Marker 3A is 100% acting on evil intentions, even though Dead Space was written by a completely different team than the later entries were, but that's beside the point. See, my belief is that the original intent with the Marker's story, at least what Glenn had thought of it, was to have them be like the fawn in the lion's paw, the lion being the necromorphs and the fawn being the Markers, as they seem at this period of time within the chronology of the series releases to be acting as conduits for defeating the necromorph onslaught, as if not then, how do you explain the way the apparitions behave in the stories? A vision given to Foster details a pedestal in which he can emulate the instructions and build the device to broaden not just the signal but the dormancy field to halt the outbreak. However, I feel like more evidence is needed here to back up this. So let's move on to the Dead Space comics. In the comics, the characters who have been near to the Marker's influence or have been affected by the death of a loved one or a co-worker begin to see apparitions. Now in these events, it was never clear if these were being produced by the Marker or something to do with the insomnia plaguing the colony. However, the apparitions all come with the same message, along with the same status as Deacon would say to his mother when he goes to see the Marker, stating that she is dead. The same would be with the good Dr. Cyrello. With his assistant Katie, the following messages are as follows. With Deacon's vision, his mother would say, Deacon, listen. You must protect it. They want to take it. Don't. With Katie, her message would be as follows. I know you would, Tom, but there are more important things you have to do, Tom. You've got to stop them. Now, what do you think the underlying message would be? Stop them? They want to take it? Is the marker using the memories of loved ones or recent co-workers to project a warning to them? Yes, indeedly so. See, this is how the marker talks to people within these events. So the underlying message would be to stop the extraction operation from commencing. Otherwise, the outbreak that had begun in the past events we talked about earlier would resume, allowing the necromorphs to begin again. You may ask, why does the marker produce insomnia to the colonists for? Well, the bad dreams, as people would say, would be a warning for an imminent threat that being the necromorphs. The marker was to try and warn them of the oncoming storm that they could be soon presented with should they continue down this path. However, the dreams would have different interpretations, like with Deacon stating that the marker is preparing them, when in reality the marker was projecting messages to warn them, using apparitions in the forms of people that they would trust, like Deacon with his mother, Cyrello with his co-worker, Isaac with his girlfriend, Kine with his wife, and so many others. This leads me into believing that the original intent with the marker was to be an entity to safeguard other species from the necromorph plight. As tell me this, ignore the law brought in by Visceral Games for one moment. Think on what I have told you right now. Why would the marker be trying to get back to the planet so badly, manipulating other characters if not for the greater good? to stop the outbreak. As before Dead Space 2, Convergence had it not been presented to us all too well. So this makes me think that the original direction for the story was that the marker was to act as a guardian or protector for the other species. In this case, humanity. The instructions for the organism could be like, for others to research the organism in an effort to find a cure. Much like how it is in the Halo universe, the Sentinels preserve the Flood in an effort to find a cure, so that could be a reason for the symbols on the marker. So now let's move on to the books, shall we? 
Now, I'm not going to act like I have actually read the books, as I haven't. However, in every single video on this channel, I do extensive research on both things I do and do not know all too well, so I do not miss a beat. However, while being written by a completely different writer, with their own set of interpretations on the lore of the marker, and their own developments, there does seem to be a change in the direction of the story. For one, apparently, the scientist who injects himself with the recombinant's life form in Marta has a vision of his grandmother stating that the marker is evil now, instead of acting in the best interest of its hosts. So there was to be a tone shift in the lore here. However, from what my research states on the various Wikipedia pages, there is no mention of this. So I am at a loss with the books, but again, there are other things like the marker manipulates a character into shooting himself at the end of Catalyst, further pushing them into more of an antagonistic role. However, the markers in these cases do not reanimate the dead into necromorphs. We see that in the later years of this dark world, which pulls us towards the second stage of the divide on the marker lore, setting the stage for Dead Space Aftermath, where the marker's properties seem to become twisted in a new direction of Dead Space. Now, heading into the defining moment that creates a gap in the Dead Space lore to do with the markers, we have Dead Space Aftermath that shows us the characters who embark on a deadly mission to recover marker fragments on Aegis 7 following the first game. However, in the concept of the marker, most of the characters are not important. However, three characters are, as they have direct contact with the Shard. Katna being one of them, and the one to discover it. Upon touching it, he would feel an intense pain inside his head, clawing away at him, which becomes even more frightening when the marker Shad would present a vision to him of his daughter, who again had died prior to the mission. The Shad can be seen to be toying with him, tormenting him, weaponizing his past trauma with the car accident connected to the death of his daughter. It would again use the bond Kutna had with his daughter to further manipulate him into killing one of the engineers, which is a far cry from the warnings it was to give the colonists of the former colony on the planet. Which, if there wasn't a rewrite on the law, then this change would not make sense within the confines of the story. Let's move on to the next character who sits beside the marker inside of his office, that being Captain Campbell of the O'Bannon, who tells Stross that he can hear the marker speaking to him. However, all we can hear are whispers, which is different to the previous entries when the marker would use the memories of trusted people to either warn them or to use them for the greater good, that being preventing or halting an outbreak. This is a small change, but not important. The main difference would be the next character's experiences with the Shard. When Strauss begins his analysis, he would be of a rational mindset, especially when he asks the captain about his state of mind. However, when researching the marker shard, he would talk about the markings, the symbols with there being no carvings or scratch marks, stating as if the crystal itself gave birth to it. He would then hear the whispers of the marker shard speaking to him, along with a throbbing in his head after being presented with a vision of the complete set of symbols, in which he memorizes and writes the symbol up on a transparent holographic board with a light pen. He would state in amazement, My God, it's a form of DNA, a blueprint. When Cho would come into the room, he would also state that the Shard is the key to an alien language and a guide to DNA chains, believing that the Shard may contain the secret to the future of human evolution. This isn't all too different from the lore within Dead Space, the comics, or the backstory logs. However, it is what happens next that truly sets the divide in stone. Inside of the captain's office, Strauss would state, the Shard seems to generate some sort of carrier wave, 
He then explains a theory of what happens when the carrier wave comes into contact with dead tissue or flesh. It will reanimate the cells, in which he continues with, possibly into a new and evolved form. Some people may question Stross's well-being at this time, but in this scene he speaks like a scientist and of a well mindset. However, at the end of the scene, he starts to hear whispers calling to him, seeing symbols all over the place with his studies taking his toll on him. Stross would then take a body, placing it into a containment unit along with the marker shard to see what will happen when exposed to the signal. He would then state, already the signal from the shard permeates the dead flesh of the subject. I've never seen anything transform an entire host so quickly, in which he never created a recombinant life form. All he did was lock a body in the containment unit with the marker shard and it began to transform. As someone has argued before that Stross in fact created an organism, I have to say with a great deal of certainty that he in fact does not. He would then be presented with another hallucination event, which forces him to breach the containment, spelling doom for all present on the O'Bannon. After this scene concludes, we then are presented to a close-up shot of a corpse opening their eyes, to show us that the marker shard, now free of the containment, had started to reanimate those within the morgue, confirming Stross's theories. Within this animated film, the lore gets twisted, so now the Shard acts more in line of being a master of manipulation, not for good, but for great evil. Pulling the strings, ensuring a new outbreak begins rather than presenting warnings in regards to preventing an outbreak. So now no longer are the monoliths a guardian or conduit of curing the Necromorph Scourge, but are now the ones to torment and bring harm to other species rather than protect them. Basically a coin flip in the lore. We would all like to think that the puzzle pieces presented here all fit perfectly together, but when you stack the facts up, it would be like trying to fit two pieces together that aren't meant for each other. If you need any more further convincing, look at Dead Space 2 within it. It shows a further antagonistic approach towards the end goal, with Nicole constantly attacking Isaac, whether that be verbally or physically, in which the marker never used to do this with an apparition. In certain quotes, however, it's even more confusing, such as, this isn't about the marker, this is about you. Like the marker's apparition is trying to help Isaac, this gets backed up when Nicole acts more friendly and less demonic and statically towards Isaac, which turns out to be a further manipulation tactic by the marker to lure Isaac to its location and to unlock the rest of the codes from within his mind via the machine so that convergence can finalize, which would be implied not to be the case within the logs of Dead Space 3. That heavily implies that all markers cannot finalize convergence because only one convergence event may happen at one given time, even if paused by some unforeseen event. For instance, Isaac in the cutscene that shows the past of Tal Volantis, when he regains his senses, he starts to mutter about the markers, about convergence resuming everywhere that the markers have spread. So now the recombinant life form story is not canon, due to the soft retcon in Dead Space Aftermath, along with there being no mention of it after Dead Space Martyr, I believe so. Although it could have been in Catalyst, but for those of you who may still remain vigilant about everything in Dead Space making perfect sense, please enlighten me. As for now, I do think a rewrite was to have been done here, as the marker is referenced to be the entity that reanimates and not recombinates dead bodies into necromorphs. You may ask, why would they do this? And it could be because they wanted to head in a different direction with the story, steering away from such things like the Flood, with them being a parasite, and the organism could be seen to act in a similar fashion, whereas a device that can reanimate the dead cells seems to be more in line with a change, perhaps for the better, or maybe the worse. 
However, if we are to change the contagion part of Dead Space and all of the media that surrounds that period of 2008 to 2010, then it would have a drastic impact on the story of that era. So that's why I still incorporate it into the story within the timeline videos. However, in Dead Space Salvage and the following games in the series, the recombinant life form gets replaced with the corruption on that cellular level. So that's why you have logs of corruption reanimating in the presence of the marker. Regardless though, I made this video as to give you a better explanation than I can do in the comments to try and bridge the gap by showing the gap or something like that. But hopefully this clears things up and sets the record of the rewrite or soft retcon up. But if you have any more questions, let me know below within the depths of the comment section. However, one thing before we clear up this video, the Marker's Lore is not the only thing that gets twisted within the games, and that would be the catchphrase of the series, Maker's Whole, that has a different meaning as the series progresses. As in Dead Space, Maker's Whole alluded to placing the Marker back on the pedestal, making the obelisk complete once more, with the device to broaden the signal and Dead Space Field. In the second game, the phrase would be for making the Marker whole, with the codes imprinted within Isaac and Stross's minds, so that it can finalize convergence. And in the final entry for the franchise, Maker's Whole referred to making the moon whole, allowing Convergence to resume. Doesn't really matter at this point though, however, this makes me kind of sad that the remake will not be retconning the Marker's abilities or properties in regards to the Divide, as it would make more sense for Marker 3A to act more like Marker 12 or the Gold Marker. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed, then give the video a like rating, comment your thoughts on this video and have a discussion below and I look forward to hearing from you. Sign up to join the British Alliance today by subscribing and ringing in the notification bell allowing all updates to be notified of the future content I will bring you and I will see all of you among the cosmos and be sure to have a good one.